Power all back it. on and everything. Have you, you know, have you got your power on and Mine, well, yeah, happened, anyway. came back. We had a big oh, storm so come through. Right. And it just knocked a lot of trees down, just did a lot of things to like luckily I have solar panels on my roof, so it didn't hit my power, but uh, it knocked the internet way out. Everything got lost, emails, everything was really, really bad. Oh, so, and I and I record with the internet now. So mm -hmm. with no internet, no good help. Which means no long line, so I can't do that. See, even the storms don't come to Wyoming, I'll get so we don't have to worry about those types oh, you of things. You get tornadoes, don't you? Or blizzards. <laughs> no, Which one? no we blizzards don't either? either. No tornadoes, no. Blizzards? No. Yeah, we get blizzards. Yeah, we get blizzards. <laughs> yeah. Not not in August, thank gosh. <laughs> God. What am I looking at behind you? Uh, I should welcome everyone. See, like I should say hello. Like that, we have uh, uh, a number of uh, of of, uh, of folks like that here for the event, and it's climbing even as we speak. Like, and uh, hey, uh, we're, we apologize once again. We were about five minutes out, like that. But um, you know, for everybody that's been doing virtual Longmire days, that's about what our average is. About five minutes into the hour, um, we finally get things all together. I mean, the the joke that I make is is that you know. There's a reason why Walt doesn't have a cell phone, you know, and so, you know, th this is all, you know, the, far and beyond, you know, Walt's capacities, like it. And so I inherited, you know, all of Walt's technical capacities too, like it. So, but uh, once again, like it, welcome, you know, to virtual Longmire days, like it. And uh, this is a this is a very special event. This is a, an extraordinarily special event for me, I have to admit. Um, so much so that like even when George's power got knocked out like that and he was unable to uh, be a part of our regular scheduled programming um i made a plea to him and said hey how about we do this the week after um just because i i just think that there's so many people like that who are so excited about the opportunity of being able to to to, to have a, an interview with you like that and also be able to post some of their own questions like that and just uh it just seemed like too much to to let slip by like and i'm glad that you got your power back and that you're here with us ladies and gentlemen mr george guidel Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. What, I have to start you... the story. I have to. I have to start the the whole thing like that by telling a story that I've told numerous times before like that. But I have to do it now. Try and keep give you the Reader's Digest version of it like that. And uh, how this happened and how it is. People a lot of times will ask. They'll say, "Well, how in the world did you get George?" Um, and they make it sound like, you know, that there's no way that I should have gotten George. Like, and they're probably right. Like, I probably was way, you know, in above my head, uh, way, way beyond my, my, my rearing, like that when I got George as a reader for my books. Like, but I did have some help. I had some assistance along the way. And what happened was, is I had won uh, the Tony Hillerman Award, the Cowboys and Indians Magazine Tony Hillerman Award, like that with a short story called Old Indian Trick. Okay? And one of the best things about it was, is I got to go have dinner with Tony Hillerman and his wife um, down in Albuquerque like that. And, uh, you know, Judy's the one that had pushed that whole idea of me writing a short story because I think all she wanted to do was just go have dinner with, you know, Tony, uh, Tony Hillerman. And so anyway, like we get down there and we're having dinner. And at that point in time, like at, um, Viking Penguin had been in touch like that. And they said that, that uh, you know, the audiobooks people had been in, in touch like that. And they were trying to figure out, you know, who it was that they were going to get, you know, to do the readings of the books. And without a moment's pause, like a Tony looks over at me and he says, see if you can get George Guidel because George does my books and he does a spectacular job like that. And if you can get him, you should try and get him like that. And so I said, okay. So the next morning I get, they call at hotel like that, and they said, um, we're looking at doing the audio versions of your books. And we've got a couple of readers that we're thinking of. The first one is George Guidel. And I said, him. And they said, you don't want to hear the others? And I said, no, if he's good enough for Tony Hillerman, he's good enough for me, okay? And uh, that was how it was that, you know, that I got George. Look at, and uh, I will always be thankful to Tony, you know, for steering me in the right direction and, uh, and making so that possible I. for me. So am I. And, you know, Tony is responsible for my career, more or less. Because when really? I started recorded books way back when they were covered wagons on the streets, I, they, I, they were having an audition for his books. His books were just starting to be recorded. And I'm from New Jersey, and I don't know anything about New Mexico or Arizona, or any <laughs> corners. Or, I couldn't tell a rope from a, from a string. And uh, I auditioned as an actor, and I got the part. And it was a series, and that series started me uh, into the serious business of recording. Because oh, before great. that, I was doing recordings for the Library of Congress, which is a totally different thing. It wasn't commercial. And it was a, a, a different 
um, aspect of recording. But okay. Tony got me into that. And after that, well, I did nothing with the Westerns. And I said, oh, come on, I can do other <laughs> books too. I can do other. And I, it, just, it just began, it started then. So I, I did a show with him once. Um, I do a, a program called The Art and Artifice of Audiobook Narration. I tour libraries with it. I did one up in Michigan with him. And he was a lovely guy. I really loved talking to him. And um, at the end of the evening, he, he would uh, talk about writing a scene and I would read the scene. And that's the way the evening went. At the end, there were two tables in front of the room. He would sit at the one and I would sit at the other and people would line up and for me to autograph their, their discs and he would sign their books. And he noticed that there was a longer line in front of my table than was his. So he, he stood up and put his hand on the table and said, hey, what is this? He's the guy that's just talking, but they're my words. Why don't you get on my table? So that was, that was my experience. And he's a lovely man. I really enjoyed knowing him. He truly was. Like, and I mean, you know, you, you, there, there are a lot of big names, you know, out there, you know, in the field. Um, but he, he truly had that sense of, um, of, of graciousness. He was just mm -hmm. an extraordinarily gracious, kind individual like that. And uh, I, I still, you know, I actually have on our old, old phone machine, um, I, I have a, a, a blurb that he gave me. And it was, it was so funny like that because, you know, I asked him for a blurb like that for the second book, uh, Death Without Company. And, um, and it took him a long time. It took like, you know, a month or so before I heard from him again. And I finally got a phone message from him like that. And I've still got the phone message on the phone machine and it's Tony. And he's like, Craig, I, I can't seem to get the email to work. So I'm just going to tell you what this blurb is on the phone here. Okay. Like that. And you just, you know, add anything you want to in it. If you want to put exclamation points or some more adjectives, you go ahead and just throw them in there. <laughs> I just thought that was one of the most marvelous things I'd ever heard in my life. Well, he did something that, or you do something very similar to what he did, because he wrote characters. He didn't write cartoons. He's, his people were deep, were troubled, were complex, were loving, were kind. But it was something as an actor you get into because it's more than just a cardboard character. And that's what mm -hmm. made it, his and your work so successful. I mean, Longmire oh, is an incredible guy. He's, oh, he's well. it's my language, even though I'm from New Jersey. Maybe he might be from New Jersey. <laughs> the whole thing. You do, you do something, I want to tell you this in front of everybody. You do something very singular in your books. It's kind of like a piece of music, which is, has harmonies, has dis, dissonant sounds. It has all kinds of things to make it, to pull you into that melody. You have the range of humor, depth, character, empathy, and a kind of sometimes literary background that while he's freezing his behind off in the mountains, he's thinking of Dante's Inferno. So it's, it's that kind of thing that makes it special. And it's, it's a joy to do, let me tell you. It's a joy to do with books. And people, God, they, they, I have so many emails from people talking about Longmire and that kind of stuff. It's, it's marvelous. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And that's it. That's all we have for today. Thank that was uh, all Bye -bye. we really needed. To do. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's a, it's a mutual appreciation society like that because I, I get all the emails from people who, uh, who, re who listen to the books like at, and you know, they, they, they really, they've never picked up a book. You know, what they do is they listen to you is what they do like that. And there are so many people like that, that, you know, I remember the first time I told you like, you know, that so many people are, you know, really excited about this. And you said, why? Okay, and I said, well, you don't have any idea how many people you keep alive, for goodness sake, you know, let alone how many you I'm keep cool. like entertained, you know, and intrigued and all of that. But Listen, just the I'm, one I'm that are out to, there. I'm close to 2000 books now. I'm coming up to oh. 2000. And oh. I do know how important audiobooks are. It used to be when I first started, it was a gig between shows. I was on Broadway, off Broadway. And when I wasn't working on stage, I'd go and do a book. But I realized after a while that there's something much more important to it, which is why they connect to it. There's, a, there's a, people go into a library and they say, I want a book by George Goodell or by some other narrator. And once they latch on to a narrator, that voice becomes a very special avenue into those people. And you get oh. a very, you get an empathic relationship between the character, the narrator, and the listener. So the listener begins to have what I like to call an accidental intimacy. 
with the narrator and, and the listener because they listen and they know and my God, the letters that I get thank for them, thanking them, thanking me for, for keeping them alive, for helping them through illness. From, in fact, one of the, I was down in Georgia once and I was late for my plane. I was going back to New York and I was in the line for security and the guy checked me out after the thing and he said, would you take that chair over there, please? I have to search you. I said, I'm late for my plane. He said, would you please take the chair and I'll take care of you. I sat down waiting for my plane and he comes up to me and he says, Mr. Goodell, can I have your autograph? Because <laughs> I had just done the thing at the library in his town. So it was, it's an incredible thing. It's something that I am so, so thankful for. It's a, it's a blessing for me to do it. And now that I'm home, I can do it in my closet. So I can go back <laughs> into the closet in my age. Yes. <laughs> Well, I do think that you're on to something there in the sense that it's almost primal. Um, you know, I think that there's almost a primal aspect to it. I think we're really hardwired, you know, to the point of uh, listening to stories. You, you know, not just reading stories, but actually listening. To stories. Right. You take yeah. The I mean, that. I think that you know, from, from, the, from the point that we're children, you know, I think that like, you know, our, our parents, you know, reading to us, you know, telling us stories like that, you know, all the way back, you know, you can go back to the primordial ooze like that and the, and the caves we crawled out of like that. I that's mean, correct. there were stories like that. And I think that that's just- go back to the you know, caveman days. And the yeah. caveman comes back and talks about his experience with the behemoth. And the kids are all, people are all sitting around the fire in the cave and they get that vicarious experience from the, the hunter who got the behemoth. The behemoth was so yes, well, we're wired. We're wired to hear things first. I think so. Before books were invented. I think so. I think so. Um, now you do actually. You kind of skipped over. Okay, you kind of skipped over. You mm -hmm. know the major part of uh, George Godel's life. <laughs> like at, um, now, because <laughs> one of my questions was going to be like, you know, how did you get started? You know, with recorded books. Oh, like, God, I, yes. I guess what was the just the, the genesis of like you know? So you mentioned being an actor. And you know, you had a you know, very, very successful career as an well, actor too. Let me tell you, there's a long version and a short version. <laughs> the short version is I'm the youngest of five boys and nobody listened to me. <laughs> so I was going to get even on them all. So now they have to pay to listen to me. So that's how, that's what, that's the short version. I was doing, I was an actor, I'm, in the, I'm an actor. I was working in New York and um, a friend of mine, an actor friend who I, I was in rehearsals with a play with him, they'd leave early after rehearsals and zip out quickly. And I said, where are you going? Don't you want to have beer or something? And he said, no, I'm going to record a book. This is a long time ago, and 1970 somewhere. And um, I said, record a book. And he gave me some information. He worked for a Library of Congress. And um, I started sending tapes to this man in that office. Um, in those days, there were reels, little reels of tape, like a five minute audition piece. And so I started sending this man tapes for about a year and a half to two years. Send a tape, no answer. Call, make the follow-up call, follow-up letter, no answer. Never a response. A year and a half went by. And I did four or five different tapes, never a response. I was on the stage, I think we're doing a play called Chapter Two at that time on Broadway. And this guy came backstage and said, gee, uh, Mr. Goodell, you, you know, would you like to do a book for me? That was the guy I was mailing my tapes to. So there were two of me, on the, one on my shoulder, one on my left shoulder, one on my right shoulder. I could have said a lot of things, but what did I say? I said, hey, I'd like to, so thanks so much. That was the beginning of it. And uh, I, I just did it as a gig between shows. It was n meant nothing else to me until um, one day in the studio, the studio manager came into the studio and said, I have a call from a librarian in Summit, New Jersey, and she wanted to know if any narrators do library shows. And I wasn't doing anything. I said, yeah, sure, I, I, I do library shows. <laughs> and the manager said, you do? I said, no, but what is she, what is she gonna pay? So she, she made a number. So I said, well, ask her this much for the fee, thinking they were gonna turn it down. They said, yes, I do it. So I went to, I, I managed to put some stuff together. I went to this library in Summit, New Jersey, in the hills, and there were like 200 people in the room and waiting eagerly. And when I started talking, something was dawning on me. This was not just a gig. It was something primal. It was something very, very important. They were hearing things on a level that they were wired for. They were hearing something. They lived vicariously. I know there's a book, there are books called The Cat Who Books by a lady named Lillian Jackson Brown. She wrote 
a series of some 27 books about cats who solve mysteries. There was, there was a little town up in Michigan and one of the worst things in the world happened in that town, robbery, arson, burglary, burning down. It was terrible, but nobody cared because those cats in some way would touch a book that began with the letter B or they would find some ways that cats gave the guy who owned the cats ways to solve the mysteries. So there you were, people didn't care about their mortgages, their bills, their diseases, their, their problems. They read these books, they, they would just couldn't get either one. They, they were so eager to get them all. And I realized that this is something, this is talking deep to people. And um, I started to do that for about a year or two for, for uh, books for the blind. And that's when the audition for Hillman came from a commercial company for recorded books. And that's what started me doing it. And now i um, getting close to 2000 and I've done many, many, many book uh, shows in libraries where, I, where I'm totally reminded of how important it is what I do. So it's, it's something that I, that I love. I get up in the morning, I get my shorts on, my sneaks, sometimes my bare feet, go into my closet, close the door, and I'm anyone that the author wants me to be. <laughs> well, I know from firsthand experience, you know, just how um, detailed you are uh, in your preparation, you know, for your books. Like, and because I, I know that I've thrown you numerous curveballs um, you know, over the years, like that. And, uh, you know, an awful lot of them have to do, you know, with the native uh, culture, uh, the native language. Um, mm -hmm a lot of things along those lines like that. But one of the things I'm consistently just amazed by, first of all, I do wait. I do wait to see what the George Guadal review is gonna be, you know, for each book. Like that's pretty darned important to me to find out what you thought about it like that because I don't think anybody reads, you know, with the sense of detail and the scrutiny like that that you're able to bring. Um, is just astounding to me like that. And so I guess my question is going to be, um, and, and you can, you know, go with this in any direction you want. Um, how, how, how do you approach a book, you know, when that, when that manuscript, because generally, you know, what you get is like a, a pre publication, you know, galley um, as a general rule like that, because get, they try and get, get your, they call, I get what they call a second pass. It's the, okay. it's the version before the final version. Uh, sometimes okay. uh, some typos have to be corrected, things like that, but what I get a book, whatever the book is, mind you, I'm not an arbiter of taste. Uh, it may not be your favorite book, but if I'm doing it, it's got to be the best book, the best narration I can do. I remember the, the saying in Shakespeare was, the center of the one must overweigh a whole theater of others. You play to that one person in the theater who knows that you're there, that you're doing it. Because if you're just sending it in, just mailing it in, everybody will find out. So that, that's always behind me. And I look at it first for humanity. I have, to, I have to know how the book ends in order to know how to begin it. And I go through the book and, well, maybe they're well, not in a series because I know most of your characters now, but in a, in a book that I don't know, um, there are about two or three characters that I can't play around with. Their voices are very, very um, staid, solid, predictable. The peripheral characters are fun. You can have fun with if, it's, if it asks for it but I have to know what you, the author, wanted me to feel when you started talking. So and that, and the, the narrators sometimes uh, don't think of the fact that exposition is character. So whoever is telling that story is a person. So you're not just reading out loud. Somewhere you, you want me to start with a tongue in my cheek most of the time. You want me to know that there's a smile around the corner, even though something terrible has happened. And that's a very important thing to know, to find out. Otherwise, I'm just reading out loud. You can read a newspaper out loud, it's the same thing. So, that, so when you get a book, it's, it's a, a fountain of possibilities, none of which you make decisions on until you're in the studio. Just a few, two or three <laughs> characters. When you're in the studio, that's when the creative juices start to go. If it's a bad book, and Lord knows there are bad books around. That starts a certain anger coming in me that I have to read this book that was chopped down and made trees into pulp to print this book. And, but I must make it work for that person who, who's gonna like it, right? So that's where it is. So those books I don't really read, I scan them. 
I know what's happening. I know it, how it ends. And it's pretty formula, and I, and I know that. There are books like yours. There are books like a lot of other writers whom I love, whose books are works of art, who are crafted novels, who thought has gone into it, feeling has gone into it, and it's, it needs my respect. And as a result of my respect and my, my love for the material, it involves me as an actor, as a performer. So I end up, I, one of the questions was, do I perform a book? Yes, of course, I perform a book. I don't narrate it. It's giving me a script and God knows I'd love to play all those people. <laughs> One of the things for me, like, because a lot of times people will ask me, they'll say, you know, well, you know, you know, you know, how do you keep track? How do you keep track? You know, after, I mean, because if you've only written like one, two, three books or something like that, it's pretty easy to remember all of the details and all this. You start getting up into 17, 18, 19, 20 books, like, you know, then it's a little bit more difficult. And maybe that's the advancement of my age, like that may, maybe it's just the expansion in there. I'm not sure. Um, but for me, like that, one of the best things to, to, to reacquaint myself, you know, and because one of the things I love to do is I love, you know, I love to circle back. I love circling back and picking up a character from a previous book that may have you right. know, been lesser served, you know, that you know, I can bring, you know, into this new book like that and bring them back. Like that. And, and also like, and I mean, I love having like an ebb and a flow of characters where they go out, they come back in, they go out, they come back in. And so for me, one of the great things to be able to do is, is you know, one of the, 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 the pastimes that we have here in Wyoming, if you need a, a you know, a quart of milk, you know, you have to go drive 20 miles to go get it or 30 miles to go get it. Like that. So you got 20 or 30 miles there, you know, that's one way like that, you know, in that oh, truck. Like that. And so I've got that CD player in that truck and by golly, George Guadal is my friend. Like that. And so whenever I'm turning around and going back to one of my previous books, I'm carrying you with me right there, riding shotgun like that. And I listen to you like that. Listen to you kind of remind me of like all oh, those characters. The one that I'm doing now, like it is one for two or not, not this coming year, but the year next like and it takes place mostly up on the northern cheyenne reservation and so i needed to go back and pick up um as the crow flies because right. you know it had all the detail like out of the topography like that and the people that were involved with that particular story and i wanted to bring a lot of them back and so you know to me you're a godsend for that alone like that's what wow. i should tell you. let me <laughs> ask you a question when you're when you sure. start a new book do you have the characters in front of you or in your head do you have a, a, a map of who you're going to include. How is it, how has it come to be when you start with an idea, whatever the idea is, how do you know and when do you know who to put in? For me, it's, it's a lot like uh, conducting a choral group is the way I describe it, you know, because for me, you know, this is, you're going to like hearing this, like, uh, but for me, it always comes back to voice. It always comes back, it always comes back to the voices. Like, and I'm always telling students when I'm doing workshops, I'm always telling them, you're only going to get to describe physically a character one time, only mm -hmm. once. But that character is going to speak all the way through that book. Like it, so if you're going to spend your time and energies on trying to differentiate those characters, forget about what they look like. What do they sound like? What words do they use? What's the cadence? What's the rhythm? You know, what's their vocabulary? Like at all of the things like that, that make up, you know, the speech patterns that they use. That's where you really want to try and differentiate the characters. And so, so you, you know, I'm sure that we agree on that. So how did you come up with Walt, mm -hmm. with Walt Longmire? How did you come up with Longmire? How did you you come know, up in, in a lot of ways, like I, I, I looked at a lot of the protagonists, you know, that were in you know, crime fiction, and they didn't strike me as being particularly honest or real. Um, you know, they were kind of like the six foot two of Twisted Steel and Sex Appeal. Every woman wanted him. Every man, you know, feared him. He could kill anyone with a Ticonderoga number three pencil in 2.3 right. seconds, you know. That's and right. I just, you know, I thought, you know, no, you know, I, I, I don't think that's going to work. Like, I, I want a guy like that, that you know, that, uh, that, that makes mistakes. Like a guy that, you know, leads with his heart. You know, um, but I did want, you know, to give him a couple of secret weapons and the couple of secret weapons that I gave him was I made him durable. I made him big um, just because generally, you know, sheriffs, you know, I mean, we've got counties out here in Wyoming that are as big as Maryland, you know, and so, you know, the guys that have those jobs, they tend to be big guys just simply because you don't get any backup. You're pretty much on your own like that. And, and generally, you know, the small animals listen better when a big animal enters the room like that, you know, that's, that's what happens, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, one of the others would be, uh, I wanted him to, to, uh, you know, to have a sense of humor. I, I, I thought that that was one of the things that seemed incredibly lacking in an awful lot of crime fiction was a lack of humor. 
And, you know, and boy, everybody that I know that are cops like at our medics or EMTs or anybody, you know, frontline workers and all that, you know, you either have a sense of humor or, you know, you, you're not in the business for long. Like that. I mean, you've got to have that sense of humor. And then the final secret weapon that I gave him that I thought, you know, I, I didn't really take into consideration how much of an effect it was going to have was uh, I made him a reader. He reads, he reads everything. And, you know, not only does he read everything, but he remembers it. And so that makes him formidable. Like that only those of us who read know how much of an advantage we have, you know, in uh, in day-to-day -day life. Um, That's what I love about the beginning. The beginning was, was marvelous, the, the introduction of him to me. He, somehow or other, somehow I felt we speak the same language emotionally of what yeah. we like, what we don't like. And he was, he was sad, he was angry. He was tired. He didn't want it. He was out of it. He was totally, and you wanted to save the guy because you felt right away he was, he was a nice guy. He was, he was worth the, the work that it would take to save him. And that's what got me into it. I mean, he was yeah. a great guy to, to be. And so yeah. when I'm, well, when I'm Longmire, I am Longmire. I am not <laughs> George Goodell. I'm who that is. I'm also the Cheyenne Nation too, because that's, an, that's another joy. I loved it when he, when he first was monosyllabic and first introduced him. He doesn't say much, but when he says it, he says it and you listen to him. But it was, it's a great story between the two of them. Thank you. Like, yeah, that, that, you know, that was, you know, that was the, the essential part of it. Like, and, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, the, 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 the other word that I use, like, at, which I guess, you know, is uh, one of those words that's, it's not very sexy and you don't hear it very often, um, decent. He's just, he's a yep. decent guy. I mean, I, you know, we all remember when we were growing up like that, or maybe I'm betraying my age a little bit, like that, but, you know, our parents told us, you know, be a decent human being like that. That was a really kind of important thing. And you look around in the world nowadays, like that, and uh, I don't know, decency seems to be like being pushed, you know, towards the back of the bus. And I'm like, no, yep. yeah, decency should be right up there driving the bus, it seems like to me. I don't know. Well, his under sheriff is very decent. <laughs> she his is. is she is. She, She's also colorful. She also has a very colorful. Oh, yeah, she's life. colorful. I love to play. She's marvelous. I change my shoes when I play her. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was important too, like that, because I think that she was a, an essential part of like that, you know, that 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 uh, that 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 group, you know, that that choral group of voices. Simply because if you didn't have at least one really sharp Eastern urban voice. You know, it would have very, very easy to kind of slip into like a Mayberry, you know, kind of sure, thing, yeah. you know. And, you know, I, I needed to have her in the room where she would say something that nobody else in the room would say. <laughs> you know, nobody there in Wyoming yep. would say what she says, you know, but she will be right there with that statement right there, you know, as soon as she can so get it. What was the know. first step? What was your first step in writing the first novel when you first got Longmire in your head? Oh, what was the first oh. thing you do? You just think, that, that do you was, see him? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Like that. I mean, the question is always: Did the story of the of the plot of the cold dish, or did the character of Walt Longmire, which one came first? Like that. And uh, and and to be honest, they kind of like you know came together. Like that. They kind of like you know they assembled themselves um, from the components of each. You know, I mean, I I wanted that you know sadder but wiser sheriff like that. You know, but I I wanted a situation you know in a case that you know he felt a a certain amount of regret, you know, uh, right. and all of these things like that to deal with like that. And then also have it be one of those, those epic kind of uh, cases where it kind of brings him back to life. I mean, we've right. got a, a man here who's like, you know, slowly but surely he's, he's, he's going away. Like that he, he's, he's, he's rapidly going away. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, since the loss of his wife and everything and like, and so he needs something, you know, to, to you know, reattach and anchor himself into this world again. And it seemed like that case, you know, was probably the one. Terrific. Bringing yep. Now, you already took one of my questions, because my next question was going to be, do you dress for your audio performances or do you just go in the walk-in closet in your underwear? Which one do you do? Well, I always <laughs> keep a, a set of black pumps and a red dress when it calls for a female character. Uh, that's the first thing. But no, it, you know, it, when I first started, women were a problem because I would go all the way up here and, and do, and that's insulting. It's, it's just terrible. And it dawned on me as I was doing it, as I did more and more, I didn't have to. First of all, uh, most authors, not you, most authors say, she said, 
and he said. So that's 50% of the work between men and women. But with voices, it's just the different voice. It doesn't have to be a higher voice. It's a different voice that takes on a lighter quality or with Vic, she's right there, she, but you know who's talking. You never know, you never think that it's somebody else. So the, you know, the, the, the um, it doesn't matter what I wear. It doesn't matter which closet I'm in. I get that book in front of me and everything changes around me. It, it becomes a, an imagined truth that I live in to broadcast it to other people. So the truth that I imagine that you imagined, I take and interpret it, and that imagined truth sails out to all these listeners. And they listen to an experience. They're not listening to facts. They're listening to an experience of people, experiences of people living life, whatever it is. And that's what turns me on as an actor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interpretive art, but it is an art. But there is artifice also. The artifice in terms of voices, yeah, sometimes you can do a Mickey Mouse. You know, I was first doing uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Victor Hugo's, and, and uh, we, were, we were looking for the voice of, of Quasimodo because he's, he's got a misplaced jaw, he's got no teeth, he's got a, and then we're trying to find the right sound. So I uh, just said to the people standing in the studio wanting to hear what I was going to do, I said, just turn your backs to me. And just the engineer and me were there, and I went, put my finger in my mouth, I said, oh, all that I ever loved. And they turned around and said, how'd you do that? I said, well, that's talent, right? So <laughs> that's the word work. And so I, every time I say that story, I spoil the experience for everybody listening to The Hunchback of Notre Dame because they can imagine Goodell with his finger in his mouth talking. So it was my own, my, my own worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, now I'm never going to be able to listen to that one the same way right. again. Like, <laughs> now, I mean, uh, that, that was, uh, that, that kind of like brings me to another question like that also. But you know what, there was a statement there that you made, like it reminded me of uh, one of the early interactions that we had also like that, because I remember when you first read The Cold Dish, one of the things you said to me was, you said, now you can try the old, I'm just an old cowboy routine if you want to but I know there's some kind of an educational background to your writing because I've read your works. And you said something along the lines of, do you have any kind of a theatrical you know, background? Look at, and I had to admit, I said, well, actually one of my degrees was in playwriting. And you said, I knew it. And I said, how did you know? And you said, you never use the phrases, the, the catch phrases, tag phrases, he said, she said. Right. You always use some kind of physical action or something to indicate, you know, or you just rely on the voice of the character to be able to do that, which Never I thought there. was just amazing. You, you were the first person to, to, to catch me up on that, which I thought was just absolutely amazing. Fantastic. And I yeah. asked you about it and you said, well, the thing is, those are stumbling blocks. You know, he said, she said, you know, they work perfectly well when you're reading a book, but if you're trying to perform a book, they're nothing but stumbling blocks right. along the way. Exactly. All you're doing is reminding people that you're reading. Which I, I thought was. Wanna, I still want to cut them out when I'm doing a book. That's as he said, she said, because it's not necessary, because I obviously said it. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's the way they write, and that's, uh, you know, I don't do that. All I do is transfer the experience. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've mentioned a couple of um, big name authors and a couple of big name books. Like, and Lord knows you've done mm -hmm. some incredible pieces of literature. I mean, some monstrously huge books. Um, classics, classics, classics. Have you ever been intimidated by one? Have you ever like, you know, have you ever had one of these tomes yes. land yes. on your desk? I was intimidated. I was intimidated by the size. Um, they were large. I mean, Les Miserables, which is wonderful experience to, to read through that book, um, scared me a little bit uh, because also everybody's thinking about Les Mis, the musical, and believe me, it's nothing like the musical. It's, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing yes. story. And, uh, but uh, as any book, you get into it and it takes me in, it sucks me right in. And it's the classics that I usually find myself getting close to because of the language. The language in, in uh, Proust, in Hugo, uh, in Dostoevsky, that's, the language is my tool. So the tool of the sounds of that sp particular and specific way of using language is a marvelous exercise for me as an actor and that helps me get into the characters 
So they ended up, I did the Proust thing and the, the Victor Hugo, the um, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Les Mis. And when I finished it, I was, I had postpartum depression. It was, I was in that imagined truth for so long. Um, I, it was hard to leave. In fact, I used to come up, come in from the city and my wife used to pick me up at the station when I was doing Crime and Punishment, for example, Dostoevsky's book. And she would look at me and she'd say, what's the matter, are you depressed? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I was just doing Dostoevsky, that's all. And it's, it's, it works on you. If you're an actor, you just can't come out of it right away and just talk, start talking Mickey Mouse. You just can't do it. So that's no. part of the love of the classics. Marvelous. Absolutely. I, classics, I have to. Now, classics are, are a wide range because uh, there's a guy in Texas, uh, Steve Harrigan, who wrote The Big Wonderful Thing, The History of Texas, which is one of the most beautifully crafted histories of anything I've ever read. It's a huge book, about 800 pages. He spent years writing it, but it's such a unique way of putting it together. And then I did another book of his. And again, it's a classic because of its depth and its people, and it's about art, and it's about family, it's about Comanches, it's about Texas, but it's, endly, it's endlessly a classic because of its depth, because of its empathy, because of its reach into humanity. That's where it goes. I have to admit, like, uh, that, um, you know, I, I appreciate what you do, like that, because I think it was, uh, I can't remember when it was, like it was relatively I, long before I ever put, you know, a, a word, bumped a word together to another word, like that, to try and write a book like that. But uh, when I was cowboying, like that, I was driving across, uh, it was either Nebraska or Kansas, I can't remember, maybe it was South Dakota, I'm not so sure, but hauling a horse trailer like that, and uh, it was a long trip, it was going to be about eight hours. And I remember, you know, boy, I was tired, like that, and I thought, oh, I got to, find some way to kind of stay awake like and I popped into a circle J or a flying J truck stop like that and and they had uh, this was back in the cassette days like that mm -hmm. and so they had you know a bargain bin of cassette audio books like that and I looked and they had uh, Moby Dick right. and I thought you know Moby Dick you know 399 how can I go wrong right <laughs> like that. so I grabbed the 399 version you know of Moby Dick like that and you know I got it's got like I don't know 12 different cassettes like that you know of course like that and so I climb into the truck it's the middle of the night I take off like that, and I'm like ready I'm ready to go I put that first cassette in George this guy obviously had um, dropped out of the Civic Theater Guild <laughs> of uh, you know, I mean, he made John Gilgood's Howling Wind speech seem like so understated, like, a, you know, oh, it was like maybe one of the most over the top productions wow. uh, I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> I think I lasted maybe, maybe five minutes before I finally had to just eject the cassette <laughs> and say, okay, this is just not going to work. Okay, so I do think it. what you're, you're saying there, like, as far as like, you know, it's got to be a marriage. It's got to be a marriage of, you know, yeah. Of uh, material like that in performance, like that, or else it doesn't work. I mean, and that's a tricky proposition, a very, mm -hmm. very tricky proposition. Like yeah, that, you're talking about you a truck stop. Like, you you reminded me. Though. You reminded me of a truck stop story. Of um, I got a letter from a guy, truck driver, um, who incidentally, truck drivers would start on the east coast to the west coast, and they'd meet somewhere in the middle and switch cassettes because they're all listening to the book. <laughs> this guy was driving. There's a freeway in Montana that goes across the state. And this guy was driving on that road in his 18 wheeler. And he was listening to Dostoev to, to uh, Crime and Punishment, to Dostoevsky. And he was so involved, he missed his exit. And he pulled over to the side and he backed his 18 wheeler up back to the exit. And of course, ran into somebody coming down the other direction. <laughs> so he was writing me a letter from the hospital, thanking me. <laughs> for the opportunity he now had to finish listening to the book and said <laughs> nothing about the accident. That's how important it is. The people just get into it and it takes you away from whatever's bothering you. Well, now another thing you've got also, like it is um, obviously, like from anybody who's heard you speak, um, you know, as yourself, like at either in performance, like at with notes or anything along those lines, like at um, how important is humor, you know, to what it is that you do? Oh, like that, because, I mean, that's that's like a language that if like, you know, if you've got a humorous book and you've got a reader who doesn't have timing or doesn't have, you know, the sensibility, you know, for humor, 
it's you're doomed to look at it seems like to me what makes the world go round humor's got to be there even sometimes when it's not and sometimes authors come to me and say thank you for putting this in i didn't really hear it that way but it really works and so that's that's my job you know it becomes an interpretive thing humor is very very important a lot of a lot of people give me books because of i have a certain gravitas or i have a deep low voice i don't have a comic voice but I love to do comedies, but I don't get too many of them. That's why I love doing yours, because it's there along with everything else. So thank you for that. You do. You, I, I can hear the relish in your voice, like at, during the humorous parts, like and I can tell oh, like, yeah. when, when you're in fact, a I want to tell you, I've heard there's a tribe in the Borneo Mountains whose language consists of knocks, tweets, burps, hiccups, and coughs, and a few whistles. So if your next book is going to be when Walt goes to Borneo for a drug cartel thing, don't give me that language from that <laughs> tribe, would you please? <laughs> now you're going down the list ahead of me here. Like, <laughs> one of the questions I was going to ask, like it was, is because poor George, like the difficulty that he has is every time I send him a new book, like I remember, I think the, the breaking point was uh, Highwayman. I think when you had to learn Shoshone, I think that was like, you know, oh, whenever right. you were yeah. just starting to get, you know, your, your Diane and your crow um, in, in pretty good shape. Like I, I slammed you with another native uh, language there. Like, I don't but, mind uh, that. Fortunately, I've that. got a couple of <laughs> I don't mind that. It's when you force me to sing off key, when I had to sing <laughs> Home on the Range or whatever that was. I forgot that song, but the forcing me to sing badly, that was not easy. But thank you for that. That's some stuff that, that's what makes life fun. <laughs> there are things I write that Judy every once in a while, because well, the way I write, of course, is I write and then I'll give Judy the pages and she'll read them to me at night when we go to bed. And, you know, because I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that if you want to hear every single mistake, you know, that you make as a writer, have it read back to you. You'll hear everything, oh, especially dialogue, like a yeah. dialogue specifically. Um, if you get bad dialogue, you'll, you'll hear it in a heartbeat. And, uh, and, and every once in a while, I'll put something in the books and she'll look over at me and she'll go, that's for George, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to admit, I have to go, yeah, yeah, I, I have to admit that one probably is for George. <laughs> So, all right. Now, my last question, like, at how much of a tragedy, how much of a tragedy was it that, you know, when they did the television show Longmire, that they did not include the character of Isaac Bloomfield so that you could play that role? I'm not going to talk about that. There's no hard feelings. I don't carry grudges. I didn't, I'm, I'm going to go home right now. No, it, it, you know, that's the way. It's Joe Biz. It's Joe Biz. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to switch over now, like that, because I always promise, like that, that I'm going to leave a certain portion, you know, of our program, like that, for the folks, like that, that have, uh, you know, some questions along those lines, and to have George here, like that, is obviously an extraordinary opportunity, like that, that a lot of people are taking advantage of, like that. And so, um, the first one on the top of the list here, like that, that I can see, like that, is. Um, for George, any advice that you can share with an aspiring voice actor? Um, anything that you can, you know, can throw out there other than like, you know, obviously the, the wonderful advice is you know, that advice that you've given so far like that. Is there anything that you'd like to relay to folks as far as that's concerned? To be a, a narrator, you mean? Is that mm -hmm. what you mean? Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult because it's a very small field and you're up against a lot of very fine actors. Doesn't mean you can't do it. What, hap what I would say is try working for the blind doing something that you may not be getting paid for, but to see if you can do it. Some of the Lighthouse or some of the other organizations that work for, for sightless people, that would give you a beginning sense of how good you're doing it. If not, there is a company called Tantor Media, which depends on people who have studios at home. They might listen to your tape, a five minute tape of your favorite material, if something you feel comfortable in, no dialects, just something human and real and honest, and send it to them and say, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you. There's a magazine called Audiophile Magazine. Audiophile, A-U-D-I-O-F-I-L-E. Audiophile Magazine is the trade magazine. You will see a lot of reviews of books in there, of, of narrations, and some articles by people, but each book reviewed will have the name of the company on the bottom of the review. So look at that, and if you're industrious and aggressive, get the address down, 
make your tape and send it in. There's another question here, like at um, for George, like at um, what uh, what 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 type of characters do you find the most difficult to find voices for? That's a good question. It's very hard. I haven't found somebody that has a voice I can't do. I don't do certain dialects because I can't. So I, if I can't do it, I don't do it. Uh, a Cockney thing. I'm not very good at Cockney. But uh, some voices. I don't know. You know, that's the artifice of audiobook narration. That's anybody can talk in another voice. And the time that you talk a voice like that, you fool around like that at parties when you're drunk. You can do it seriously in front of a microphone. But it's it's having the experience of an actor to make it work, to make it come out. So now that most people, I haven't come up against anything that, gee, I can't do a voice of that person. Well, look what the one I just told you about, Quasimodo. Put my finger in my mouth and say, oh, 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 oh. that works very well. <laughs> Well, this one's a little closer to home. Like when you get a when you get a Craig Johnson Walt Longmire book, um, what kind of preparation do you look forward to? To reading it. That's all there is. <laughs> I know the characters well. I know the kids. Let me see new characters. <laughs> Thank but you, I know <laughs> Walt and Vic, and I I know them all, and um, I can't wait to meet him again. That's all. It's like meeting a, some people that that's part of your family. It's I know who they are, so I I look much less work goes into that than a new book. <laughs> this is a question for both of us. Like at its, um, we mentioned, we made a comment about how, you know, we feel as though like, you know, the hardwire, hardwiring process of being read to look at. And the question here was, is like, was there someone in our lives who read to us? Like at, and uh, I can say honestly, yeah, my mother, you know, when I was a child, like that, you know, read to me, like at, and my father was a big one. If he found something interesting, you know, in the newspaper, or, you know, if there was a particular passage in a novel or something, he would stop what he was doing. He would stop reading, like at, and look up and say, listen to this, like at, and then would read it, you know, to us, like at, and, uh, and that, that was, he was a voracious reader. He was constantly reading. And so oh. that was a constant source of material, I have to admit. So, you know, for me, yeah, I kind of came by it honestly. How about you, George? Well, I remember the first book my mother read to me, and probably the only book she read to me, was a book called Pain. It was a family of ducks living on the Yangtze River in China. I remember this because, I don't know how old I was at that time, but I was thinking, God, what an interesting story. And how do the ducks talk Chinese? <laughs> how, do they, how, do they, how are they Chinese ducks? And that kind of, it always stayed with me. And I said that story once in a Washington, in a show in Washington, and that librarian gave me a copy of Pain. She brought it, she brought it out and, and gave it to me. And it was marvelous to see those same pictures were embedded in my reptilian brain. And I saw that duck and that duck is still talking Chinese. It's amazing. <laughs> I tried to explain to my granddaughter yesterday that, uh, you know, pigeon uh, Spanish is not the same as pigeon French. Like, and that the pigeon really, right. they, they really don't speak either one of those languages, to be honest. Like that, so. The funny thing about this all is that my mother always told me as I went through elementary school, high school, George, you never pick up a book. You have to read. You have to read a book sometimes. <laughs> never did. I got through high school on classic comics and went through that. And I didn't start to read until after I left college to become an actor. It was interesting. And then here I am, reading, reading, reading. So many books and so little time. So little time. <laughs> now, here's a question that's a little more technical. Like, um, this, this, this reader would like to know, or this listener would like to know, um, what, uh, how do you, like, break down a book as far as, like, the amount of recording that you do every day? Um, you know, uh, and how long does it take you generally, you know, to record an entire book? I mean, obviously, it would be yeah, different. Yeah. Depends on the size of the book. Most books take about four or five days of recording. A day for me is about 9.30 to 3.30, uh, with a little break for lunch between that. And that's the normal recording time. Um, usually there are four or five days. Some books are very long, and they take me longer. But the, the, the uh, bulk of the performing is between 9.30 and 3.30, 4 o'clock, something like that. Because other than that, the voice gets tired, and... Uh, I get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
<laughs> that sounds a little bit like my writing process too. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, like a, you know, <laughs> that hunger thing, it kind of gets in the way after a while. Like a, you know. Do you ever get into a writer's block? No, no, I really don't look at, I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear, you know, if you ever get stuck, you know, when I'm in the preparation, for, I, I would imagine you don't get stuck once you get started, you know, whenever you start recording a book, but if you've ever gotten stuck, um, you know, getting ready for one like that, where you, you, you had a, a, a hesitation there where, you know, something, you know, mm -hmm. kind of stalled you out like that. I would, I would say probably not like that same thing. No, with me. No reason I, for it. It's, a, it's, if I, it's if I'm getting on a toboggan and going down the hill on a sled. <laughs> And you're going, and that book is carrying me someplace, and uh, going to end up right side up. I hope. <laughs> That's always the case. You're always right side up every single time, George. Um, like the uh, oh, well, uh, this is a question. Like, at, um, what's your favorite Craig Johnson book? There, there. That, I have to get that. I have to sneak that one in if I can. There is no, there is no favorite Craig Johnson book. They ask me. A lot of people ask me that. It's all of them. It's every one of them. It's because everyone is just as good as the other. They're marvelous. Some are, some are a little heavier, some are a little lighter. Doesn't matter. I don't have a famous book of that. Because it, it, the characters stay the same. The characters there, they evolve, they grow, but they're the people that I'm friendly with. So um, I look forward to them each time, each time. There's no favorite Craig Johnson. So someone's asking the question now, like that, um, they said over you with know, close to 2000 books, what's the, you know, what's, what's the parallel like that between like, you know, how many like classical books that you do, you know, that are brought in, you know, from a canon of works that have been around, you know, for a hundred years, whatever, and how many are new books, like in books that like, you know, are new publications. Yeah. Most of them are new. The, the classics would have uh, no royalties or their public property. I don't know what the right term is, um, but so don't do too many of them because they don't sell that much, but they're there. I mean, I have a couple of couple of shelves full of the classics that I've done, but I haven't done anyone recently. The, um, I keep the bestsellers, the thrillers, the, the stuff that sells fast, the stuff that sells slow. Um, it just keeps going, thank heaven. The, uh, the, just, I just did, uh, there's a book called The Patriots, which I'm gonna begin in about a week written by, oh my God, I as in Groom, I think his name is, Great Historian. And it's a story about Jefferson Adams and uh, Franklin, I think. No, Jefferson Adams, I forgot the other one. Um, three of the Patriots. Hamilton, 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 Adams, and Jefferson. They're great stories. They're three great little novellas of who these men are. And it, it's written again with such craft and specificity and historical accuracy that you begin to really know these fellows and your idea of the founding fathers becomes a little richer as a result. He's a great historian, terrific writer. There's another question here. Like at sometimes your presentation of the books brings such joy or emotion to me, even though I have probably already read it. Does it bring joy to you or sadness? In other words, are you acting in the moment such that you feel the emotion of that scene when you read it? I couldn't do it if I wasn't feeling it. That's that's the only that's the important thing. It's as I said before, it's an imagined truth that I have to enter into. Some I tell favorite line of mine is I feel like I'm a literary hermit crab crawling into somebody else's imagined truth and living there for a while and spreading it out. So it, yes, if I, if I don't feel it, you won't feel it. Uh, I can't fake that. So yes, it's work. And sometimes I, I have that to, have to stop sometimes if it really moves me. There are a few times when, when tears are in my eyes, I couldn't read the book. And that's, that's because it's there. And sometimes with my engineer who is listening and is moved by it, and she has to stop, or he has to stop, because they can't see the copy. So we have to take five minutes and just rest. Some of it is very moving. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. Like, I think one of my favorite quotes is the one from Steinbeck when he won his Nobel Prize for Literature, when he said, all good writing is something that approaches a, a humanity, a universal humanity. That's right. That's what it and is. I think that's like what you were saying earlier there, as far as like, you know, if, if the humanity is there, you know, you can feel um, the, the characters like it and the stories will tell themselves almost it seems like That's what happens right well we have crept up our full hour and oh, uh, we have taken enough of your reading time my oh, good please, friend, like today. 
Okay, more. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I think I got the majority of questions in. There were a few I didn't squeeze in like that, but I know that we're running out of time. Well, and I people, are, people are more than, um, more than happy if they email me questions or send me an email, go to my website and contact me. I'd love to, love to talk to them. There's actually some folks like that. There's someone that asked if they, how they could go about getting your autograph, Mr. Goodell. George.goodell.com. There you go. See how easy that is. <laughs> George, thank you so much. Like, and I know that this was difficult for you and you had to surmount, you know, some amazing difficulties like that and being able to be with us here like that. And I know that uh, we look forward to next year when uh, so I think maybe we should, we should get George Guadal to come to Longmire Day. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, that maybe George, you know, at that point in time should get a hat. <laughs> what do you think, folks? Well, George not a bad a idea. <laughs> Thank you so much, Craig. My pleasure, pleasure. George. Thank pleasure you. Pleasure to know you. Uh, you wonderful much. to have you. And then we'll look forward to talking to you again in no time at all. Right. Like, Take care. Thank bye you, bye. sir. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>